In this video, we'll set up a system that can export Houdini particle simulations of up to 2 million particles to Unreal Engine really quickly. It's a bit of a technical setup, so have a look at the free project files in the description if you want to follow along, but you don't want to write X. So you've made this really cool simulation in Houdini and you want to render it in Unreal. How do you do that? Usually you'd go for SideFX Labs' Houdini to Niagara plugin, but if you have any experience with that plugin, you know that it's really slow in cases like this. So we're going to build our own. So I've come up with this solution, which basically turns each point into a pixel on a texture and saves the position data as color information in that texture. And that can be loaded really quickly by Niagara in Unreal Engine. I've made this HDA, which basically does the job for me. So I just plug in my simulation and it turns it into a grid of points. Through a cop network, it exports this information into a 16-bit floating point data texture. I'll show you how this HDA is built up. Before we do that, I'll just quickly go over the export process for an Alembic file because, as you might notice, we also have these balloons in our setup. So I just make sure that I have them separated. I delete all the attributes that I don't need. In my case, I only need the position and the UV attributes. After that, I add vertex normals. I do a vellum post process to subdivide it and I transform the geometry to Unreal Engine space. That means rotating it 90 degrees in X and uniformly scaling it 100. Then you put down this ROP Olympic output and you make sure your frame range is set correctly and you just press save to disk. Now let's look at how this HDA is made. To do this, you need to drop down a transform to put our simulation into Unreal Engine's coordinate space, rotate it 90 in X, scale it minus one in the Z axis, uniform scale it by 100. We need to write some VEX in an attribute wrangle. So we need a few variables first. The first one we need is an integer and we'll call this maximum point number. This equals endpoints zero. This essentially just takes point number we can see here, puts that into the variable max point number. We're going to make a texture size. Now our texture is always going to be square, so we just need one value to represent both lengths of the sides of the texture. So this equals the integer ceiling of the square root of max point number. This way we make sure that we get an integer and we get the rounded up version of the integer of the square root of max point numbers, our texture is just big enough to contain the data for all of our points. We need to store the position attribute that we currently have in a different attribute. Call that v at hos equals v at p. We need to make the grid. So we're going to make an integer called x and we're going to make an integer called y. x needs to equal the point number modulo texture size. y equals the floor value of the point number divided by the texture size. At p equals a vector. This vector has x value of x and 0 and y. If we display the points, we can see now that what used to be a simulation somewhere around here has now become a massive grid. If we comment out this line, we can see where the simulation is. Now for later use, we'll just set a detail attribute for the texture size. So we're going to set detail attribute of the geometry stream 0, name this texture size. We're going to take that from the variable texture size. We'll just name this wrangle gridify points. Now I'll drop down a null named out points. So we'll drop down a COP2 network, go into it, add a color, go to the image tab, tick on override size. In here, we're going to reference our detail attribute called texture size. So we type in detail and we find the out underscore points and we want the texture size attribute and zero. So we see here that's 833 pixels. Then we're going to copy this parameter and paste relative references in the Y size. So now these sizes are both 833. We're going to set this to C RGB and the default depth we need to set to 16 bit floating point because that's the highest amount of data that Unreal Engine can process with textures. Now we need to put the position data into the color of this blank texture. For this, we need a VOCOP2 generator and we'll enable that. Go into it. We make sure that each pixel gets the correct point. This part I didn't come up with at all. This is all from Junichiro Horikawa, who is linked in the description. So we're going to take the X resolution and multiply that by the Y resolution. Then we're going to put that into a subtract. Now we need to make what it needs to be subtracted by. We take the X resolution and subtract that by the pixel horizontal coordinate. And then we put that into an add. We add it by a multiply. And in this multiply, we multiply by the pixel vertical coordinate and 
the X resolution. That then gets fed into the subtract. This is our point number, which we're going to use to get our attribute. So we'll drag out and write get attribute. And you'll see it goes in the input I2, which is the point or primitive number. The attribute we want is called pos, P-O-S. We haven't filled out this input properly. We're going to add a parameter and we'll set this parameter to be a type string, name it geometry, then connect the geometry output with the file input of the get attribute. One last step in the VOCOP is to take this A data and break it up with a vector to float. And you'll just match each of those components with the R, G, and B values, like so. Now we need to go back to our copnet, and we'll see now that we have a string field called geometry. We need to make it so that we can search for a specific node in Houdini, and we're going to do that by going up to this cogwheel here, edit parameter interface, and choosing an operator path. Drag and drop that over here, and we'll name this operator, apply and accept. So now we can find our node by going here and simply finding it like you would anywhere else in Houdini. So geo1 outpoints. And now we'll take this operator and copy parameter and paste relative references in the geometry string. And to make sure this works, we just write op colon for operator. And now we'll see that our vopcop starts to output something. Now all that's left to do in Houdini is to export this texture. So we're going to go back, we'll build a ROP network. Inside the ROP network, we'll drop down a composite. So for this cop path, we'll go back here and we will find our VOP. We'll name this composite node pos because that's the name of the attribute we want to output. And then in here, in output picture, we're going to make it put it into a separate folder called $OS. We don't really need to export the alpha. Then you're ready to export. And this should only take around one second per frame to export. So we'll press render. If you've done everything correctly, your sequence will look something like this. And now that you have this, we're ready to go into Unreal Engine. Configuring our Unreal Engine project, we're going to go to games and choose the third person. We're going to turn on ray tracing and we'll set a project location and a project name. Then press create. We will set the project settings for rendering and we'll enable the plugins that we need later on. So go to edit project settings, search for lumen and enable use hardware ray tracing, search for ray tracing and enable ray trace shadows and ray trace skylight. Shut down the project settings, go to edit plugins, search for the movie render queue. This one enable. After enabling this, you need to restart. Press restart now. We're going to use Niagara to render our particles. So we need to create a Niagara system and we need to make a setup that allows the Niagara system to decode our texture to be able to set the position values based on the values that are in our texture. To do that, we'll make a folder first, call that Niagara. In this folder, create a Niagara system. We will create an empty system. Press finish, name it NS underscore particles. We'll go into the Niagara system, right click, add emitter, add an empty emitter. We need to set up this emitter so it's ready for us to load in the attributes. So with this emitter selected, we're going to go over here on the right hand side and enable requires persistent IDs. Go to sim target and change that to GPU compute sim, then enable fixed bounds. And we need to make sure that these bounds are big enough to encompass our entire simulation. For this purpose, I'm just going to set all of the values to 1000. So minus 1000 and 1000. In emitter update, we need a spawn burst instantaneous. And this value needs to be set to the particle count that we had inside of Houdini. And you'll see here, in my case, we're dealing with 693,529 points. We'll put that in here. And now we have a lot of points in the center of the world. Under initialized particles, we need to make sure that the lifetime of the particle is long enough to last our entire simulation. So I'll just set this to 10 because I know my simulation is not longer than 10 seconds. Same thing over here on the system for the loop duration. We'll just set this to 10 as well. For the sake of this running a little faster while I'm recording, I'm going to go up here on the preview and hit the real time button here. So you'll see now that real time is off. We're going to go here to the Niagara system and create a user parameter, which is an integer. And we'll see over here under parameters, a new Niagara in 32 popped up. We're going to rename this texture size. Then we'll make another parameter, which will be a float. And this float will be called kill percentage. This is something we'll use later as an optimization system. So we don't have to render 700,000 particles all at once, but we can just render a percentage of it until we have to render out the final image. We need to make a scratch module. We can make this by going under particle update and clicking the little add module here, writing scratch and choosing new scratch pad module. Now we're inside our scratch pad. The scratch pad is quite a lot like using a pop vop in Houdini. Here you have the attributes that you're getting from the simulation.
simulation. And over here on the other side, you have the attributes that you're setting on the simulation. What we need to do now is specify which attributes we want to get. We want to get a texture and we want to choose the texture sample. This is going to be our position texture. Then we'll add a unique ID. This is like the PT num in Houdini. We'll also add an integer and we'll name this integer texture size. Now we need to sample our position texture. So we'll drag out from there and we'll search for sample and choose sample texture 2D. You'll see here that we need to specify some UVs. And if you remember, we did a lot of work in COPS to build up a set of UVs from point numbers. And we're essentially going to break that back down. Again, I didn't figure this math out all on my own. There's a YouTube video I followed, which did a great job at explaining how the math worked exactly. So we need to take the modulo of the unique ID and the texture size. Then we need a float version of the texture size. So you drag out from there and type float. We're going to divide the modulo by the float version of the texture size. We need another float and this float will just be a value of 0.5. So you can set that here next to the value handle. Just type 0.5. So that will always be the value of this node. We need to divide this value by the float version of the texture size. We need to add these two divides together. So we'll drag out from the top one, right? Add and drag the second one into the B input. Now this is our U value. So we need to make a vector 2D. So we'll take the result here and type vector 2D. And you'll see that that goes into the x or also called the u value of the vector 2d. Now we need to make the y value. The process is very similar except this time we'll take the unique id and divide by the texture size. We will then divide this division by the float version of the texture size. Then we will take this division that we did up here and add with the division we just did. This result will be our y value. Now we'll use that for our uvs. Kind of like a bind export we need to use this map set to set the position and we need to select particles position. Then we drag the value into the position handle and you'll see that it says convert vector 4 to position. That's great. Press apply and maybe we just go over here and rename this scratch module to something like apply texture data. And now would be a good time to save. We'll save this asset. Go back to the system overview over here. If we go to the apply texture data module, we'll now see that we have two parameters. We have a texture parameter and we have a texture size. Now we'll connect our texture size kind of similar to how you would in Houdini by going here to the texture size and pressing the little arrow. Then we'll write texture size and we'll see here user parameter texture size. We'll select that one. This now means that we can set the texture size per instance of this Niagara system to be sure that we don't crash our system by trying to render a lot of particles all at once. We will go to the particle spawn and add a new module. This module is called kill particles. So here you'll see it's just a boolean. It's a little tick box. You can either select on or off. We want to delete a percentage of particles. The way to do that is going here again on the little arrow and set bool by float comparison. We want to say A is greater than B. So A will be equal to one still and B we will set to a random range float. This needs to stay between zero and one. And now this A value will essentially become our percentage to kill. If it's set to one, we're not going to have any particles. But if we set it to something like 0.95 we will kill off 95 cent of our particles and retain five percent again to be able to work with this when we're out in our level click the little arrow here next to the a value and we'll set this to our user value called kill percentage and we'll save this asset if we go back here to the niagara system we can see under user parameters we can set default value of some of these parameters so i know in my case that the texture size that we're going to be dealing with is 833 so i'll just set it to that and the kill percentage i found a nice number for this particular simulation is 0.95 then we'll press save again so we've done all of this uv math and we're now going to create a new level so go up to file new level empty level then we'll take our niagara system and drop it in and this is not our simulation at all we didn't load in our textures in any way we need to do that to be able to see anything here we're going to use something called media textures to use these we're just going to right click and go to media and choose image media source i like to name this h for houdini 
underscore pass for the attribute name. Then you go into that, you go under sequence path, make sure that the EXR sequence that you're intending for Unreal to load is the only EXR sequence in the folder. So that's why I had Houdini created in a folder for itself. And you need to make sure that you select only the first file in your EXR sequence. I'll open this, right click, go back to media. This time, select a media player and enable this video output media texture asset. We'll name the media player MP underscore pause. Then we get this media texture, which I like to name MT for media texture underscore pause. Now we need to open up the media player and double click this H pause. We need to go to the details panel and enable loop. Then we need to open up the media texture and set the output format to sRGB linear output. In order for us to be able to run this predictably every time, we need to create a level sequence. So we'll go up here to this clipboard and add a level sequence. For now, we'll just add it out here and save that. Then this sequencer window should pop up. We need to right click here in the gray area where we will add a media track. On this media track, we'll press the plus button to add H pause. We'll set the sequence to 24 frames per second which is what we exported from Houdini. And we'll just make sure that this sequence is 148 frames, just like our Houdini simulation. Frame zero isn't part of this, so we'll just make sure that we start at frame one. Sometimes there will by default be an offset on the sequence. So we'll just right click this and go to properties and check that the start frame offset is set to zero. We'll also make sure that the media texture is set to the correct one. So MT underscore pause. Now we need to tell Niagara that we want to use our new media texture pause. So we'll go into our Niagara system, go to our apply texture data module, go to texture, search for MT underscore pause. Go back into the world. And to be able to play this back better, we will add our Niagara system into our sequencer. So just drag and drop, press track, add a Niagara component zero. Under Niagara component zero, add another Niagara system lifecycle track. We'll set this to run from frames zero right click go to properties age update mode set to desired age now when we scrub through we can see that it just goes back and forth following along with our frame number we're going to go back to our niagara system one thing we're not doing in this situation is sprite rendering so we'll delete that module and under render we'll add a mesh renderer we want to render spheres so we'll go under here under meshes where it says none and we'll simply search for sphere and we need the sphere that says that it's approximate size is 100 cube. Now we have some spheres. That's still not quite what we want though. So we'll go back to initialize particle and now we need some information from Houdini again. We're going to go under mesh attributes, go to mesh scale mode where it says unset and set it to uniform. Then we'll go back to Houdini and we'll just go to our geometry spreadsheet and search for the P scale. And we'll see here that it's 0.002125. I know that we need two times this value. We're going to set it to 0.00425. And now if we set our view mode up here to unlit, we will be able to see that our simulation is running in the viewport in real time. Amazing. In order to make sure that this has the right scale and that everything is working, we should take our Alembic cache, put it into our scene. So just find your .abc file that you exported from Houdini, drag and drop it into your content browser. We need to select import type, geometry cache, and scroll down. Make sure it doesn't say create materials and that find materials is also disabled. Press import. Once that's done we can drag our balloons geometry cache into the scene and just make sure that the transform location is set to all zeros we need to also control the timing of the alembic cache so we want to drag the cache from the outliner and into the sequencer i'm going to press the plus button go down to geometry cache make sure that the geometry cache track starts at frame one play it to see that it does in fact line up great so to recap we've exported our balloons as an alembic cache and we've built a system that can turn any number of points into a large grid of points. Then through a cop network, we turn that grid of points into a texture, which we export through a ROPnet. Then in Unreal Engine, we've built this particle system, which has this custom module that allows us to read our texture data. It renders meshes, and it has this optimization feature, which is a kill percentage. So you can change this to something like 0.98, and you'll have even fewer particles or 0.98. 0.5 and you'll have even more particles. Of course, when you render, you set this to zero. And we've also set up a level sequence, which allows us to play back our simulation in real time. In part two of the series, we'll add materials, set up nice studio lighting, and go through some tips to increase the quality of your renders. Hope to see you there.